PowerPoint presentation. Here it is. And kind of <laughs> slide on. I actually didn't know the technology that was going to be available, and I really was going to hear my PowerPoint slides. I used them on the back. I wrote all of my notes, which I will use for, for, my, for my presentation. So, uh, I had a Bernie Fort, a former Coopers and Library and co worker of mine back in the late 70s and 80s, and uh, nice to see Bernie here. Um, I thought what I would do this morning. Give you a little bit of background about myself, a little bit deeper than what Lewis has provided you. Um, tell you how I got to the position that, I, that I'm in today. Uh, several of you I know are interested in learning a little bit about Rosamund, Rosamund Gifford, who was the benefactor to our foundation, and I will give you a little bit of the color in her life, uh, quite an interesting character, uh, leading up to the creation of the foundation. And I have a short video, maybe two, five, six, seven minutes total time that if technology works, I think you'll find, um, get you awake if you fall asleep listening to me. It's got loud music and, and a little bit of vibrancy. And then I'll come back and I'll talk a little bit about what we do today, what our business is, which is very different than it was for the first 45 or 50 years of its life. We do things very differently now than we did. So that's my plan. I'm, I welcome questions. I love it if you can keep your questions short to the point if you can. Don't hesitate to interrupt me. If, if that's appropriate, I don't want to talk beyond something that I've tried to say to you. Uh, so do, do just jump in and say, well, tell me more about that. And I'll either say, I'll get to it later, or I'll answer your question right away, if that works for all of you, okay? So um, the Dirk slide. <laughs> the Dirk slide says that I was born and raised in Albany, New York. I was the product of a family in a manufacturer of a manufacturing business. Uh, Mom and dad um, worked in the brush manufacturing business. What, you may all probably know as the Fuller Brush Company. Mm -hmm. The higher end hair brushes that were made for Fuller Brush were made by the Mohawk Brush Company in Albany, New York, mm -hmm. business that my grandfather started. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the world in which I was raised for the first 18 years of my life had that re social responsibility of a business as well as a fairly large employment base. Um, Mom is 93, uh, very, very active and involved. I just said to Claire, this past Saturday night, the Albany Institute of History and Art had their annual gala with 350 people present under a spectacular tent, and my mom was the honoree. So it was really a nice recognition. She started volunteering there when she was 17 years old, and she's 93, so 76 years of continuous, took a break during the war. Anyhow, way more than my mom did. Uh, as Lewis said, I, I went to Utica College, I got a degree in public accountancy, I was hired from the campus to go work at Coopers and Librand, where I worked for 12 or 13 years. Left there to go be the director of finance and uh, forgot, controller and director of finance, something along, something along those lines, where I worked for three years. When I left there, I started a venture capital fund with what was ultimately five partners, all focused on making investments in upstate New York. It was really an economic development fund, an economic development initiative uh, with private dollars no public money to speak of. <clears throat> we operated that fund for 12 or 13 years, made 30 investments, most of them very small, but we helped get some businesses started. And then in 2002, we sold that business to a New York City-based fund who continues to this day to operate it, but they're focused downstate more than they are focused up here. But several of the businesses that we funded um, are still operating today and, and doing well, and our investors all got a decent return on their investment. Um, when we sold that business, I was a trustee of the Central New York Community Foundation, and I worked there for about four years in hopes that I'd be their president, and instead of me, they hired Peter Dunn. Have you had Peter Dunn as a guest? Yes. So I, I, instead of me, they got Peter Dunn, who's a lawyer who's worked at a much bigger foundation than the experience that I could bring to the table. I worked with Peter, respect him a lot, continued to work with him, uh, had a great experience there, worked with Peggy Ogden and, and so forth. Um, genuinely believe from those very early days in Albany that we all need to give back and be responsible to the community. So it's kind of, in, it's, it's in my blood, if you will. I've been married for 36 years, I had to do the math, 36 years. Uh, my wife and I live in the house that we bought just inside the city limits off Genesee Street. Uh, we bought in 1980, so we've been in the same house for a long time. We have three kids, 31, make sure I do the math right, 31, 28, 21. Uh, the oldest one just graduated from Clarkson with a physician assistant studies degree and has a job at St. Joe's, so he's coming back to Syracuse. Mm -hmm. Happy about that. My middle child, Ted, is a teacher at the North Country School in Lake Placid, New York. It's a small boarding school for nine-year-olds through 12-year-olds. Very, very 
young kids. A lot of them are international. A lot of them come from New York City, uh, bigger cities around the country. And my baby is a junior at St. Lawrence University, studying ocean sciences in the North Country. Uh, when I came to Syracuse in 1976, I started to get involved by volunteering with various and sundry organizations. Uh, I went on the board of the Central New York Association for the Hearing Impaired, uh, the Mental Health Association. I just got involved in a broad spectrum of organizations trying to use my accounting background uh, as a way of giving back, but for me it was also a way of getting to meet people. So I created a great network for myself. And I did that uh, from 1980 until I went, the last board that I was on was the Community Foundation Board. I serve on a couple of industry related things right now, but uh, mostly as a part of my job responsibilities at the foundation, I have uh, not gotten, gotten engaged in more organizations. So that's me in a nutshell, maybe a bigger nutshell than you really wanted, but uh, that's, that's where I am. So I thought, here's my next PowerPoint slide. There's <laughs> Rosamond, for those of you who can't see. Can you hear me okay in the back? Do I need to stand in front of the microphone? Are you okay? So Rosamond is my next slide. I thought I'd give you a little bit about her as an individual. She was born in 1873 notwithstanding the fact that her tombstone says that she was born in 1880 something, she tried to lie about her age and uh, <laughs> pretend to the world that she was younger than she really was, but she was born in 1873 and died in 1953, uh, 80 years of age. She was an only child. Um, her father was the district attorney in Central New York in Syracuse and Onondaga County uh, and worked at the Hiscock Law Firm, what we now know is just changed last week, Hiscock and something, but I know it as Hiscock and Barkley, it used to be Hiscock, Cowie, Bruce Lee, and Winnie, whatever. Uh, but he worked at that law, he was a partner in that law firm. Um, her mother was, her mother's family was from Tully, and the Tully Historical Association, I believe, is in the home that Rosamond's mother was raised and where Rosamond spent a good portion of her life. Her mother and father were sort of estranged. I don't think that they were legally divorced, but a lot of the reading that I've done basically so all indicates that they weren't together. So. You can go figure that one on your own. I don't know that. Um, he, uh, Rosamond's father had a house on West Onondaga Street, the 300 block of West Onondaga. I don't think it's still standing. If it is, it's pretty run down. Um, I was there not that long ago, and it's not in very good shape. Uh, but he also owned a farmhouse uh, at the end of uh, Thompson Road, at the end of Warwick Road. So you go up from Erie Boulevard up, and there are two big white houses, and one of them was uh, Rosamond's father's, and um, he ultimately sold <coughs> land that he had purchased from Frank Hiscock and some subsequent purchases, all the land that we know as Lemoyne College. His, his are, farmland, farmland that was owned by Rosamond's father. There's an area that borders on Lemoyne and Lemoyne in that South Springs area called Gifford Manor. Yep. And there's Oric, there are, there's yes. Oric, but some of those, the Oric name also, um, one of the early trustees of the foundation was a, Shirley Oric was a descendant of that. All sort of interconnected. <coughs> it's basically where the Wood Community Church is that area between Salt Springs Road and Thompson Road and Springfield Road and that whole area, for also where the Jewish Community Center was probably in that, that could well be, I don't know how far it came, I don't know how, how close it came, but it could well be. And you'll see there's a picture, see I knew Claire, you're gonna, you're gonna mess me up. Uh, we, you'll see in a minute that in fact, uh, Rosamond is, and her father um, have uh, gravestones, markers at, uh, right in the Dewitt Community uh, Church Cemetery that's right there next to the cleaners. And there's a picture of her marker there. How was that way? Uh, Rosamond was, uh, a little bit unusual. She was married at age, she ran away and was married at age 17 and divorced at age 18. She found her husband, uh, she spied on her husband and saw that he was not behaving appropriately. Thank you, you said it, not me. Uh, so that was in, in Cleveland, Ohio. And she came back uh, to Central New York for a short time and then went to Boston. She was a musician, a very talented musician and she studied music for a number of years in Boston, the harp particularly. Um, and uh, sh she uh, was lured back. I think this is, to me, one of the, the parts of the story that I think is, is interesting. She was, she was lured back by an arrangement with her father. He wrote her a letter 
and said that if she would come back to Syracuse in central New York, that he would leave his substantial estate to her. But if she wouldn't come back, he was going to cut her out. So she came back. <laughs> she came back. Aha, but it's really interesting. She insisted on a contract. So she wrote a contract with her father, and her father transferred the ownership of the farm and all the animals and all his belongings to her and committed to including her in his will as the life beneficiary of whatever, the, not the life beneficiary, to own the assets that he had when he died. And sometime right before he died, two, three years before he died, he changed his will and cut her out. <laughs> Created a provision for her to get income if she needed it for her life. But Rosamond, being who she was, contested it in court, had a contract that had been signed while he was alive with her that said this is what's going to happen, and the courts respected it, honored it, and gave her the million and a half dollars that was his when he died in 1917. It worked. A million, a million and a half dollars in 1917 was a lot of money. There are more great stories about her eccentricities. I'll, I'll touch on a couple more of them in a minute. Who would have got it if she didn't get it? The bank. Oh, oh. The bank. She, he set this up with, with the provision that the trust department would run the money for her if she needed it, and when she died, they would get it. Who gives oh. the money to a bank these days? Oh. <laughs> uh, when, she, when she won the money, she, she really became quite, she became quite reclusive. Uh, she bought a farm on the north shore of Oneida Lake. Who knows where Jewel, New York is? Somewhere is between Sylvan Beach, you know where it is? Yeah. There are little signs there today. I, I have a little cottage up in that neck of the woods, and there's a sign right on Route 49 that says Jewel. But there's not much between the Welcome to Jewel and the Goodbye Jewel sign. <laughs> uh, there was a wonderful farmhouse, actually, that um, was sold, subsequently sold to the Vela family. And there's some Vellas here in town. Joey Vela is a physician who's a Vela. Yeah. They run the grocery store in Constantia. So, and unfortunately, the house burned down. So the only thing that's left is the barn, and, and uh, it's quite tattered and, and, and destroyed. But she went and lived on the North Shore of Oneida Lake. She loved animals. She had zillions of cats and goats to feed the cats and eat the milk. And she had one hired hand, and she had really good sense about investing. She was very frugal. She only came to town to meet with her lawyer and her banker and her accountant and investment people. Otherwise, she was on the North Shore. She never came, she never came into town. Um, somebody asked me earlier a, a, a little bit more about what was sort of made her tick. She was not particularly philanthropic. She was not particularly charitably inclined. She hated the government. <laughs> she used to write her checks on April 15th to the infernal revenue oh. <laughs> True story. And sort of the, the frosting on that cake is that she died on April 15th. Oh. <laughs> uh, let's see. Said that she died in 1953. She had an estate of about five and a half million dollars. So it went from 1.6, 1.7 million dollars in 1917 to 5.5 million in 1953. Not too small of a cash of cash. Do you know where her money was during the Depression? I do not. I do not know how it was invested. Um, and interestingly, I'm going to show you a short video on the history. Got some, as I said, keep you awake in case, in case you're getting a little bit drowsy. Uh, the will that she created, she had no heirs. There were a few cousins who contested the will, but the will that she created um, was challenged by the IRS, such as those things were. Uh, and basically, it was a, an attack on the law firm that had um, created the, the will because it basically said that it was not a valid charitable entity that was being created. So they wanted to tax it, take 50, 55% of whatever she had. But the trustees that were subsequently appointed contested it, and they also proved I actually have a, I have the actual canceled check that the trustees had to write to the Internal Revenue, they did say Internal Revenue Service, <laughs> to pay the estate taxes that she, she wrote in 1954. Um, there were five trustees named as part of her will. Uh, those five trustees were the banker, the lawyer, the investment person, and there were two descendants, both females, of other advisors that she had had. So there were five trustees in 1954 and 1955. Three men and two women, there's a picture of them in, in uh, the video that I'm gonna show you. Um, her, pro probably the greatest thing that she did in her will, and I think for the, this community, when she wrote that will, 
was basically to say, you can do what you want to do with this money as long as it's for charitable and philanthropic purposes. I think she said, I'll read it to you. Uh, for religious, educational, scientific, charitable, or other benevolent uses. So for the trustees, there was no folk, it doesn't say Central New York. It doesn't say you know that it you know, can't be used for big grants or little grants or wide open, which was really a great thing. Our trustees today and for the entire 61 years of the foundation's life have been able to do what they felt was most appropriate for, in this case, this community for its duration. So let's see whether I can do some technology here. Can I take the lights down for me? Mm -hmm. This is a, about five and a half minutes, but I think it's vibrant enough it shouldn't put you to sleep here. Who was Rosamond Gifford? Rosamond Gifford was uh, a very unique individual, marched to her own drummer, very much a recluse, animal lover. That's she liked right. horses. And she liked horses. Animals. Yeah. She moved from here and went to the Oneida Shores. Every year at tax time, when I write my check to the government, I want to do what Rosamond used to do, which is say to the Infernal Revenue Service, I don't. She's buried in DeWitt. I think it was amazing that her father, as an attorney for the city of Syracuse, was able to amass $1.25 million to leave to her, and then her, to, to have that kind of money, period, and then to, That's her. to grow it was amazing. Rosamond did not have any family, any heirs, and was advised by a group of uh, Central New York bankers, lawyers, and accountants. Her lawyer and her banker said, well, why don't you start a foundation? It was a board that was dominated by members of the families of those advisors for many years, continuing into the period of time when I first came on the board. And I would have to assume that it was Wink Berman that made this foundation succeed very, very quickly. Gifford gave out scholarships that really provided first generation students access to higher education and they helped build buildings. They had become known in those early years pretty much as a bricks and mortar foundation supporting capital investments. The Lemoyne College campus is on the site of the original Gifford Farm, and I think there was always quite a bit of support there. The Rosamond Gifford Zoo, the opening of the school social work. Gifford Lecture Series, which is superb and continues today. It was a slow evolution to go from bricks and mortar to this really being engaged in the community. We had some really, really difficult conversations around race and class at the board level in, in terms of our decision making. The really tough decisions were made when Bob Dewey decided that they were moving away from the, the paid board and trying to get uh, people more engaged and broadening the, the mission and, and the involvement of the board. In addition to discussing size of the board, the very important aspect of diversity in many ways. We started in the mid to late 90s to look at our community with a, a different eye and look to the resources of the foundation to grow capacity in organizations and in individuals. As the direction of the board's vision changed, so too did the requirements to grow our staff. Kathy was hired uh, in the late 1990s. We hired Kathy into those two roles, first program director and then executive director and allowed her to really lead us in building the applications around those concepts that we knew were important but we didn't know where to go with it. We became embedded funders, really spending time in community and making sure that the dollars were, were being used in a way that made sense to the community and that the community had control over those dollars. We do support arts and culture organizations. We support continually the zoo. The Oswego Bookmobile was a wonderful grant. We were involved very early on in the Southside Food Co-op, the Westside Resource Center, the Oneida Community Mansion House. In 2003, our neighborhood gang and gun violence work started, and that was really the door that got us down into the south side of the city of Syracuse. Started with us in the community, talking to people in the community. We were trying things. Yeah. Community gardens, small home repair projects. 
on the south side. We fixed, I think, 92 different houses down on the south side because we realized there was a big population of people who owned their homes, but they weren't going to be able to maintain them. Here for Canyon to the community wants to know what they can do to better the south side and empower the people. We learned a lot of lessons on the south side and we took some of those lessons learned and began to do some great work on the near west side. The near west side initiative. We started the organization and funded the incorporation of it and got help with the first board. To engage neighborhood residents without gentrifying the neighborhood. And they got to talk to the neighbors. This is their neighborhood. They want to help improve this neighborhood. They come to us as residents and support us in what we need. The What If Grant has opened many doors for people. The What If Mini Grants really stemmed from an early project which was to show some movies in the neighborhoods. The What If name sort of stems from the concept of fill in the blank. We could help neighborhoods who were committed, enough of them get together and say we got an idea. They didn't have to have an organization. We could find a fiscal person to be responsible for the money grant we've given. Our relationship with Onondaga Earth Corps is very special. It initiated out of a small grant that we made. And these trees we're going to plant, I want you guys to feel some responsibility. These are your trees. To say, listen, it's not about me, it's about you, and what you want to do, and what you can do. We're trying to turn this whole city into a green city, clean city, for better quality of life. With other funders, and as a convener, we've supported the growth of the Ideas Collaborative. Watching Gifford make an impact with this Ideas Collaborative. There was these four organizations that had an event. Their audiences are predominantly black, predominantly white, and they came together at St. Paul's Church and they had an event. So people were exposed to organizations and music that they would not be exposed to ordinarily. We also support leadership development initiatives. We're teaching people and giving them the tools to be great board members. And the board development our workshops that we do is helping people to understand what it means to have a diverse board. One of the projects that Gilford is most proud of and is very well known for is our advanced program. Three intense years as we were reformatting and restructuring almost the whole agency through this program, but it gave La Liga a lot of strength after all the work got done and we still uh, use all of the materials and all of what we learned to advance and it's what keeps the agency actually uh, on its feet. I think Rosamund would be very proud of all that has been accomplished in the last 60 years. I hope that she's very proud of what the Gifford Foundation has done over these years because we've certainly used that money for other things. <laughs> A lot of statistics, but I think it's important for you to get some perspective. Until about 2003, so the first uh, 50 years, if so, give or take, 40 years, eh, 50 years, uh, we granted um, 30 million dollars, 31 million dollars. About 25 percent of it went to various com community agencies. 20 percent went to education, library-oriented kinds of not-for-profits. 20 percent to health hospitals and health organizations, 10% uh, to arts and sciences, 10% to youth programs, and 15% to other uh, religious organizations, senior programs, and so forth. Plus, there was a program that ran from 1957 to 1980, which is not it's mentioned in the video, but it's not included in those, those statistics. 139 individuals received a Gifford scholarship, which in the early years was 100% scholarship to go to college for four years and in later years filled a gap, whatever was not provided by the college or <laughs> other assistance that was available. And there are folks in our community who I'm sure many of you know um, who are the recipients of some of those scholarships, partial scholarships. Um, uh, Sharon Brangman is the gerontologist at Upstate, very nationally recognized, president of the American Gerontology Association, was a Gifford scholar. 
Um, I get phone calls, I probably get one or two phone calls a year from Gifford scholars that say, what's going on? What's, what's Gifford doing today that's interesting? So it's nice for me to be able to, to reconnect with them. Um, during, during those years, up to about 2003, the money really flowed up. $30 million in that time was a lot of money. Um, we've changed the way we do things now. Uh, at the time, the foundation, I had this, this data point, which I thought was interesting. At the time the foundation uh, was created with that five and a half million dollars, it was the largest endowed philanthropy in central New York. United Way had money, Community Chest had money that flowed in and flowed out, but there was nobody else. Even the community foundation was not well endowed at that time. Uh, it, again, it was a small organization, and back in 1955, it did not have a lot of, of resources. I, I thought it might be interesting for you. I, I want to just give you one more little couple minutes on sort of the old Gifford Foundation grant making. I don't take a minute, I want to talk to you about the landscape of endowed philanthropy in Central New York, talk about some of the other foundations. And I'll talk about what we do now. How am I doing that once? Good. Okay. Uh, the first grant uh, from the Gifford Foundation went to St. Joe's. It was a $9,000 grant for six incubators for premature babies. My favorite part of that story is we put it, <laughs> when we had our 60th celebration last year, we put it in a press release that that was a case, the case. And the next day, mm. I got a phone call from St. Joe's and said, wouldn't you like to celebrate your 60th anniversary by another grant? Today? <laughs> 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 Most of you undoubtedly know uh, that the Gifford, the, 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 the lar you know of the largest grant that the foundation has ever made. That was a two plus million dollar grant for the zoo. And actually, it isn't a grant for the zoo, it was an endowment for education at the zoo in exchange for which they provided the naming rights. So the money, a lot of money, some of it was able to be used for operations and other programmatic stuff, but there's an endowment at the zoo for educational programs that come out of the zoo, $2 million, so I think it was $2.2 .2 million actually. Um, it was interesting to me, I was refreshing my memory and getting ready for my comments this morning, how many, um, organizations, programs, things got started or were, were the foundation, where the Gifford Foundation made a profound grant, something that made a big difference. The Urban League was founded in 1965 with the Gifford Foundation grant. Um, there have been grants to improve public housing, solariums, lounges, crafts rooms, chapels, um, neighborhood centers, along with activity programs for children. One of the earliest Gifford Grant <coughs> launched the School of Social Work at Syracuse University in 1955. And there were subsequent grants, such to the point that the university trustees wanted to name the School of Social Work, the Gifford, Rosamond Gifford School of Social Work. The trustees did not want to do that. I don't know why they didn't, but they didn't. Lemoyne, Lemoyne College, which now occupies much of the former Gifford Farm on Thompson Road, Road, received money for its faculty residence, an academic building, a new library, the Recreation Center and Science Building renovations and equipment. Uh, and in 2000, a major grant was used to create the Gifford Family Theater at Des Moines College. The Gifford grant for the Everson Museum of Art was the single largest contribution to the building campaign. Somebody else wants to hear? Perfect. Wants to hear more about Gifford? Uh, Gifford grant for the Everson Museum was the single largest contribution to the building campaign. Regular gifts went to the Rescue Mission, Salvation Army, United Way, Elmcrest Children's Center, and annual holiday dis distribution programs. I read someplace else in, in one of the histories that until 2003, the Gifford Foundation made a six-figure large substantial gift annually to the United Way, which we stopped doing sometime in the early 2000s. They do, obviously, their programs have evolved. And we have, as you'll hear from me in a minute, grown our staff and are using the, a lot of the resources that might otherwise have been directed to the United Way into a staff of what's now six people, five full-time, two half-time people at Gifford. Uh, another groundbreaking idea supported by the Gifford trustees was a radio television workshop for religious broadcasts. Again, remember, no restrictions. She could do whatever she wanted with her money. Uh, first in the United States, all major faiths participated and the format was eventually adopted for use around the world. The Interreligious Council of Central New York, now Interfaith Works, uh, was launched with the Gifford Grant and continued to receive, <coughs> continues to receive support for projects. I mean, I could go on. A lot of you know the, the, the grant that was made to Friends of Central Library, the Focal 
organization that is the sponsor of the nation's largest library-based lecture series. Uh, it was is a result of a, I think it was a $150,000 grant to Friends of Central Library. We don't make grants like that anymore. We really don't. We'll talk a little bit more about what we do now, but uh, the largest grant that we have made in my five-year tenure at the foundation is a $50,000 grant to a Southside food co-op that's trying to create access to folks who live on the south side who otherwise might not have access to fresh produce, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables. But our grants are small. We have programs that involve more money, but I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. I just thought it would be relevant for you all to have some appreciation for what the landscape of philanthropies is in central New York. I think I calculated that there are, there are 10 foundations in central New York that have staff. So organizations that are endowed, whose purpose in life it is to give money away, have somebody doing it, either half-time or full-time. Of the 10, five are one employee organizations. Um, there are, as in any community, there are family foundations, there are public charities, there are private foundations, there are donor-advised funds. I'm sure when Peter Dunn was here, he talked about donor-advised funds. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are the only private foundation with a staff of more than one, and we're the smallest. And I go through and list the Reisman Foundation, the Shinneman Foundation, the John Ben Snow Foundation, the Allen Foundation, and the Gifford Foundation. We have $21 million, give or take, today. Budget of $1.5 million annually, but our $20 million principal uh, is smaller than any of the other foundations that you hear. The Central New York Community Foundation has $180 million much of it, probably half of it, is designated funds or funds that are donor advised funds, but still have probably 90 or 100 million dollars of unrestricted money. Have a question, sure. Yeah, how do you handle your investment? What is your investment policy? And how do you go about investing your money? Good question. I'll give you a short answer, and then if we want to come back to it later, we will. <coughs> so, for a number of years, until about 11 years ago, the, the financial resources were managed by either an individual or cohort of bank trust departments. And around 2003, 2004, the trustees, having suffered through what happened in 1999 and the tech bust, um, hired a firm called Colonial Consulting. They're based in New York City. They consult with our finance committee. And they make recommendations about what, what asset classes, stocks and bonds, international, what asset classes we should be invested in. And then they also advise and make some recommendations about what kinds of managers there might be within each of those categories. So our trustees are responsible. The trustees have a finance committee of bank presidents, wealthy family folks, people who are running accounting firms, and so forth, to, to be a savvy recipient of the consultative advice. And that's been that way for the last 11 or 12 years. Um, so the largest uh, public charity is the Community Foundation, as I said, with $180 million. There are a lot of donor advised funds probably accumulated both at Fidelity and, and uh, you know, all in Vanguard and so forth, as well as the Community Foundation. That's where an individual sort of retains the, the privilege of advising somebody how to make distributions. But from an organized philanthropy perspective, um, there's, there's not much, uh, we, we are light in central New York, probably half of our peer cities. So we don't do as much as we used to do. We'd love to have more. Um, the community will, would be well served if everybody, when they died, left 5% of their, their net assets to the charity of their choosing, whether to a community foundation or a private foundation or their church or their favorite organization. We need to work on that, and I'm part of a group that's trying to figure out if there's a way to do that. But, uh, so I just wanted you to, to get, a, get an appreciation. There are 10 of us in town, and we do get together. We play really nice together in the sandbox, <laughs> often collaborate on, on on initiatives and, and both tap into the financial resources as well as the human resources that the other foundations have. Okay, let me talk for a minute, if I could, about what we do now. Um, I mentioned earlier $21 million is the principal, that's uh, the five and a half million that Rosamund left has grown to be, and from that, we spend somewhere in the neighborhood of 7%, which is pretty aggressive, about $1.5 million budget. 
but our long-term investment track record for the last 10 or 11 years is, is in excess of that 7%. So we're not living with a lot of eye towards the future, but we are living within our means, if you will. We have five full-time staff people and two half-time staff people. The half-time people are an office manager and our controller. The five full-time people have very specific responsibilities. We have an executive director who plays no golf, who doesn't do anything, kind of hangs out and, and tries to make presentations in the community about philanthropy and about the history of the Gifford Foundation. And I supervise the staff. My staff, when I came to the Gifford Foundation, I had not been responsible for making one grant. And yet here I was now running an organization whose business it was to make grants. We don't raise money. We don't do any development work. We get gifts. Sometimes people do make gifts because they appreciate what we do. So my job is to work with my staff, work with my trustees, and to be engaged in the community. My three senior staff people each have very defined responsibilities. One is responsible for all of our neighborhood initiatives, our on-the-ground grant making in the neighborhoods with neighborhood associations and with like groups coming out of churches or other kinds of smaller organizations. We do uh, leadership development in the neighborhoods through her, her programs. We have a woman who's responsible for all of the rest of our community grant making, our responsive grants. So when a not-for-profit comes to us and wants to seek funding from us, she's the person responsible for doing uh, the initial intake and conversation. And she has an associate who works with her, um, much less experienced. And um, we have a woman who's responsible, her title is Director of Research and Projects. And she has led us um, through a whole bunch of community activities, including convening the refugees, organizations that serve refugees in our community so that each of them knows what the other is doing. Catholic Charities, Interfaith Works, the county, the city, uh, just so that there's good, good, good communication, which there wasn't previously. She also led us into a collaborative of six funders who put collectively a $1.2 million um, into a fund called Ideas, and it was a collaborative of funders to support the arts and culture organizations in Central New York. Some of that funding went to what's now CNY Arts. There's a website that if you want to know what to do this weekend, from a cultural perspective, you can go to cnyarts.com. And they all now are contributing, the arts organizations, it succeeded the Cultural Resources Council. You may all know the CRC, Cultural Resources Council. But they now have a leader who is engaged with each of the arts and culture organizations and in promoting arts and culture in the community. And that seems to have worked really well. She's currently uh, leading an initiative to address transportation in Central part of the Onondaga Citizens League study. So she works hard to bring people to the table. She does a lot of listening. She's a professional facilitator, and we use those facilitation um, services to help the not-for-profits in our community. As I said, the biggest grant that I've been responsible for so far is to the food co-op on the south side. It was a $50,000 grant over two years. But we have a much bigger program. It's called Advance. It was mentioned in, in the video. And Advance is a capacity building program. It takes organizations Generally, not organizations that are struggling, but organizations that are already strong. We try and find an organization that has a strong leader, that's open to change, and is doing important work in the community. And we help them, mostly through consultative work and an assessment, to do more of what they do, to do it better, and to do more of it. And it helps an organization, the initial phase of that um, program, is to do an organizational assessment. What's working, what's not working. If your phone system isn't working, you're gonna have problems taking phone calls from your computers. <coughs> so the Gifford Foundation, as a result of that assessment, would say, okay, we'll give you money for a new phone system. If, as a result of that assessment, your computer system isn't working, we can support you getting new technology or communications or... So we try to do an assessment in that program to start off an organization so that they know if they have weaknesses, what those weaknesses are. And we don't just help them identify them, then we help them fix them by giving them a grant. We give them a consultant who will work with those organizations for up to three years in some of the programs. So there's a relationship of an independent consultant, not one of our staff, somebody we hire for them, working with an executive director and a leadership team, including their boards of, of directors of those organizations. Those grants range from about $75,000 to $125,000 over the two or three year period of time. And I think we've done 23 of those organizations. We've also built, as a result of that program, a cohort of consultants in this community who know a lot about the life cycle of a not-for-profit.
because they've been trained by a national um, consultant that we engaged to do some training. And that resource has had a ripple effect to continue. They continue to do work not for Gifford or for the organizations that we funded, but on their own, in their own right, which I think has given a common nomenclature, if you will, to the consultative process in our community. And it's, it's been a very successful program. We also work in a whole host. I mean, the, the list of, organ, of, of uh, projects that we have and initiatives that we have really could go on for, for quite a long time. We've decided that our human resource is as valuable or more valuable than our financial resources. So we're using these people who have experience and expertise to help organizations and individuals grow leadership skills. We do board trainings. Uh, right now we have a, a program called Nourishing Tomorrow's Leaders, where we took applications from, I believe, 43 individuals from whom we selected, from which we selected 25, to go through an eight-week program uh, all of the folks who participated in the program come from underrepresented populations, whether they be African American or Latino American, or physically challenged, um, maybe have a sexual orientation that's different. Trying to give um, the, the pop these populations some leadership skills and some board skills so that they can go and get involved and represent those interests on the organizations that are in Central New York. We also do a board and senior management workshop on board training so that board members and executive directors can learn how to work better with one another and be more efficient and more effective in what they do, make sure that they know what their fiduciary responsibilities are and so forth. Um, just wanna say one more, one more thing and then I would like to shut up and, and take some questions from you if you have them. Um, we recently had a staff board retreat where we um, had a validation, if you will, of, of our commitment to diversity. And I took a moment and I reflected on our board. In the five years that I've been uh, the executive director, we've had members of our board who are black, white, Latino, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, representing North, East, South, and West. We've had some 20-somethings, have some 20-somethings, and some 80-somethings, and everything in between. Uh, we have uh, folks that are veterans, we have folks that are in business, we have folks that work at nonprofits, and don't just have them there because of the way they look, but particularly because of what they think, and have a genuine interest in giving the collective board the benefit of diverse experiences and expertise. And because we don't ask our trustees to give us any money, and we don't ask our trustees to go raise money to ask others for money, we can pick folks who, who we think truly represent those kinds of interests and can inform us in the grant making that we do. And it's worked really well. We have a great, genuinely great board of trustees now that are, we meet, the board meets monthly, the grants committee meets monthly, and we have a finance committee that meets monthly. So 33 meetings a year that I'm sort of responsible for, and I have great attendance. They wouldn't come if they weren't engaged in it. Uh, as I said, um, I love what I do because I love the contribution that it makes to the community. I think Gifford is known for being a little bit out there. We take a little bit greater risk than some of the other funders in town. Uh, we're not afraid to try something and if it doesn't work, change it. Uh, we love, we have a film series that we sponsored and a grants program that we, that we have called What If? And the concept is, well, what if we tried that in Syracuse? Or what if instead of doing that, you tried this? And it has fostered some great, great things in our community. Everything from buying shovels and gloves, $600 worth of shovels and gloves for residents on the near west side of Syracuse who were so frustrated that absentee landlords weren't shoveling their sidewalks or having them snow blow professionally. And the city wasn't doing anything about it. They said, we're gonna do it, but we need the equipment. So Gifford said, okay, we'll give you the $600. Go buy the shovels, 50 shovels and sets of gloves and hats. And the sidewalks are generally, not complete, but generally getting shoveled down. <laughs> Didn't have to work, but that one, I think that one did work. So. Anyhow, that's 45 minutes of Rosamund Gifford, the Gifford Foundation, and me, and I'd be happy to take questions right after that. I have a question about um, the uh, philanthropic part of someone's legacy. I saw you were at one point, maybe still are, involved with Leave a Legacy organization. Um, 
was that what you were referring to, or are you working with other people on um, encouraging people to put something in their will? Or? Um, so Leave a Legacy is very much oriented to development professionals, how to help the person who's responsible for raising money for Salvation Army, hospitals, the Great oh, Crisis okay. Center, and see, give them some resources to, to they collectively can, can promote the concepts of philanthropy. The group that I'm referring to is very informal at this point. There are probably 15 or 20 community leaders that are still in sort of the talking stage and figuring out what it is that we can do. Um, but we did some data collection, and if you look at the data and you take the 10 cities that are larger than Syracuse in population and the 10 cities that are smaller than Syracuse in population, 21 cities, guess where Syracuse is? Second from the bottom. Why is that? But we've lost the crowd signs and the carriers and the, and you know, some of the cities that are on the top of the list maybe you get rid of because it's the hometown of, of Walmart out in Arkansas. They have you know, huge numbers. But when you get rid of the outliers, we're pretty low. And that's as a percentage of, our percentage of giving um, as a percentage of our income, not our wealth, which is a little bit different. And it doesn't include things like church and faith-based giving because you don't necessarily report that to the IRS. And it's, you know, there are a lot of caveats, but there was pretty clear evidence that we were not where we should be. And we knew the endowed philanthropy, the community foundation had done some research. We knew that we were below, below water there as well. So there are a lot of people who will talk to you about your philanthropy, whether it's your accountant or your lawyer, or whether it's the development professional at the head of your favorite uh, charity, or somebody from the community foundation, and there are a group of us, and I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk about helping them get whatever they want. The nice thing about my job, I have the second best job in Central New York, right? I get to give away somebody else's money to make Central New York a better place to live, work, and play. The only negative for me is I have 14 bosses because there are 14 trustees, right? <laughs> Bob Falter is the sole trustee of the Marshall Leesman Foundation. He's the only one. He answers only to himself for the charter that he was given. So he's got the best job in Central New York. Another question? Yes. You talked about the 60 people who got shovels and hats and so forth. Now, I assume they didn't know that this was available. So your organization must have said, we could do, how do you go about? So uh, the, the What If program, that, that's a, one of our mini grant programs, we do promote. We do promote because the woman who's responsible for our neighborhood initiatives is engaged in the community. She's on the board of the Near West Side Initiative. She has two children at home that are involved in the city schools. She's now on the board of that Near West Side Initiative that, that Gifford was instrumental in starting with the university. Um, we talk about it wherever we go. You now know that there's a program at Gifford that if the senior center wants a grant to do some community, doesn't work here, I'll explain why in a minute. But if the senior center wanted a grant, you would know to pick up the phone and that mini grant program is restricted to the city of Syracuse. Um, so the, the, the sub suburbs are not eligible for our mini grant program, but they could be. There are other, you know, other grant programs, not just at the Gifford Foundation, but at the Community Foundation. That, you know, our footprint is Onondaga, Madison, and Oswego County. But because we're a private foundation, our trustees can say, you know what, I like that program we gave to the Auburn Musical Theater. Right? They can make exceptions when they need to or when they want to. We tend not right now, we're in a, we're in a phase to get a, keep ourselves away from those really big grants. We don't give to the colleges, universities, or hospitals right now. We tend not to give to endowments. We tend not to give to capital. So it carves out a lot. We really like the concept of working with organizations that are more grassroots, that will be impacted by our average grants, $15,000, from that one organized program. So giving $15,000 to a $53 million campaign in St. Joe's, trustees basically have decided that it doesn't have enough of an impact, certainly not the same kind of impact that the $15,000 would have at a smaller, not for profit organization. Yes, sir. Given that the Gifford and the Community Foundation are the two largest, that leaves the eight other foundations, do they have, generally speaking, specific interests that they focus on, considering their funding? They don't have as much in funding. So, uh, I just want to cor correct you. And then I'll answer your question also. So the Community Foundation is the largest, 100, yes. 180 million dollars. Yeah. Gifford is the smallest, oh, with, so. with 21 million dollars. So the Reisman Foundation, the Pomeroy Foundation, the John Ben Snow Foundation, they all have somewhere, generally actually, they generally all have between 25 and 50 million dollars. 
So mm -hmm. that just I wanted I wanted to get that point. Some of those foundations are very highly focused. I'll give you an example. The William Pomeroy Foundation um, is very highly focused on um, uh, Bill Pomeroy is a leukemia survivor, and he's been very focused on the registry for blood donors and, and, and organ donors. And he's very interested in his historical legacy and ancestry, so he does ancestry funding. Beyond that, he's very selective. So health issues and, and legacy and, and history and ancestry issues, as an example. Some are completely open, the Community Foundation and Gifford, with the exceptions that I've given you. Um, the Allen Foundation uh, tends to try to prioritize uh, Cuga County or the western part of, of Onondaga County, but they were a partner of ours in, in, in our initiatives. So they've funded organizations and initiatives that we've done, very progressive, I would say. And their, their foundation, although private, is growing because they still have living prospective donors in the family. We don't have any of that. Um, John Ben Snow, pretty broad. John Ben Snow has actually two pieces. They have one piece of their foundation that only gives locally, and then they have another piece, about half, that's national. Um, Emerson Foundation, pretty broad, but they focus on college and university programs. So yes, some that are highly focused, some that are broad. Uh, and the library is a great resource to find out what foundations are available for what causes, both local foundations and local funders, as well as some national funders. Back a few years, didn't, didn't the Gifford Foundation give a bit of money to this library? Absolutely possible. <laughs> I, I, you know, I have that statistic. I, I think that that uh, eighteen hundred and something odd grants have been made by the Gifford Foundation in the last fifty years. In, in the fifty years, so I don't know them all. <laughs> but we do fit. We do like library a lot. We, we tend not to support. Um, recurring operations. If we don't see that there's a program that we can fund that will get sustainable on its own, we tend not to be inclined, which is not to say never on all the things, particularly from Gifford. But if, if we provided funding for a staff person to come to the library and do the historical research, and we don't provide recurring funding or we don't provide an endowment for that, then at the end of the year or two years, that person who's been hired to do that project either has to have created funding stream for themselves or get fired, and we don't like that. Mm. So we, we, we try hard to make sure, we'll fund something, and we might even occasionally do multi-year funding. We tend not to, but we occasionally will do multi-year funding. But we have partnerships. We did a, a grant with the Community Foundation and with the Allen Foundation. The Community Foundation took the first year of the program, the Allen Foundation took the second year of the program, and we took the third year of the program. Mm. That gave them three years to get sustainable. We told them, at the end of the three years, you're on your own. And I think they're there. We're, we're not quite there yet, but I think they're on, in, a, in a way to do that. Yes, sir. You're telling me to sit down and be quiet? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> what, if any, is your follow-up after a grant has been granted? Hmm. So how do you... Great question. How do you get your nose into that? It, it, it's a great question. And, and one which we have a lot of internal discussion about, because how much do we want to invest in data collection and tracking of a grant that we've made for $15,000? And how much do we want to charge the grantee, the organization receiving our grant? How much do we want them, how much time do we want them to spend tracking the data around that $15,000 grant? Mm -hmm. So we have developed something that came out of the military, it's called an after action review, where we've pr uh, composed four questions that we ask grantees who get full grants. And it's, you know, what, what did you set out to do? What was your intention? What did you accomplish? And what, what, what is there a gap? We also ask them among these questions, what should we have learned by the grant that we made to you in hopes that we can make better grants in the future? <coughs> we do some data collection, so that we can know the impact. We know, particularly with our larger initiatives and our larger programs, we, we try to gather enough data to be able to say to you, you should, whatever, give, give you the answers to some of the critical questions about the program so you know that the program was successful or not. So there's a, a, a mid-grant report that's due and a final report that's due. In each case, it's to ask, to answer 
four or five questions that have been, been posed and which we alert them to as we give them the grant up front. There's a grant contract and, and they're required to, as part of that contract, to provide that report midway through the grant period. And we're very, we're not completely casual about it, but we're pretty relaxed. If, you know, if you're three or four months late with your midterm report or you're three or four months late, we'll let you know. But we don't, we don't stand there on the day of the due date of the work thing and say, you know, give it to us. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're pretty flexible. Yeah. How do you apply that so, process? Great question, and I, I probably should have covered it. Um, we don't accept applications for grants. We invite applications. So before you um, are able to submit a request for funding, we'll have a conversation with you, either face-to-face -face or on the phone. Generally, they're face-to-face. -face. We'll either come to you if there's something relevant about our being there, or we'll invite you into our office. When can you we come to the senior center? I, 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 want, I, I don't want someone running an organization or responsible for fundraising for that organization to spend a lot of time on an application if I know we're not going to fund it, if it doesn't meet those key criteria. So we will invest 30, 45, 60 minutes in a conversation to understand what you're doing. I like it best when I can get my staff to go to the organization because I think you get a better feel when you're in the senior center than when you're talking on the phone to, uh, to somebody at the center. Um, but as I said, I want to be careful not to waste anybody's time. One of the things that's been a real benefit for us by doing that is you may come to us because you're building a building. You don't know that we don't fund capital projects, but we'll have a conversation with you about your technology. So how is your technology state of the art? Um, is your executive director going to be retiring in the next year? Do you need some help with transition or a search or can we help you? We, we literally, I don't, whatever, there was a large, well-recognized um, human service organization <laughs> in town, a long-term, even had been a founding executive director, 25 plus years, announced that he was going to be retiring, had identified and had been working with one of his senior staff people to be his successor. But she was going to need some help. She had never run an organization before. <coughs> so Gifford offered, as a result of the request for funding for capital, we said, we don't do capital. But we think this transition that's going, you could probably use a coach. How about if we get you a professional business coach to help you with the transition so you have somebody to talk to? And we think that your board isn't totally prepared for no longer having somebody who's been doing this job for 25 years. We think they're going to need some help too. How about if that consultant works with your board as well? Out of the blue, they thought they were coming to ask us for money for their building, and we gave them a grant to help them with a consultant to deal with the succession plan and transition. So we don't, you can, you should. The answer is pick up the phone and call the Gifford Foundation, and the woman at the other end of the phone, because I'm the only guy there, I do answer the phone though when nobody else is there, or even when it drives me crazy that it's ringing. Um, the, there's a process that we will try to direct you to an online inquiry so we can get some basic information. Name of the organization, are you a 501c3 organization that can receive charitable uh, grants, um, address, phone number, things like that. Get some basic information and then we'll call you back and find a time to either come for a visit or have a phone conversation or have you come in. We talk to anybody and pride ourselves on that. We don't say no to anybody, we're happy to have a conversation even though sometimes we scratch our heads and figure out what the heck was somebody thinking. But we do. Yes, sir. Just a, I, I'm actually an advisor, and I had this conversation with clients about charitable giving and legacy planning. And other foundations and groups have been acting and coming out and actively seeking donors. And I thought I heard somewhere in there in the conversation that you're not really actively pursuing that kind of avenue, but how would you, what's your interest in, in looking at potential donors and um, it, it's been a little bit of an internal struggle for us. So when we have someone who's proactive, who has expressed an interest, we want to have that conversation. And I think maybe to my fault, um, I've been one of the ones that's been a little bit resistant for two reasons. One, I used to be a development person. I used to do it for a living, to go talk with people about their charitable giving, to try to give to, in that case it was to the community which gives you a lot of flexibility because they'll let you do almost anything that you want. But I've done it. 
and, and I know what it, what it means. The other side of that coin is that it also takes, if, if I'm successful doing development work and I take a, a bequest or a, con, or, or a gift, if you will, it may be, be coming to me at the expense of some other organization. And it's an organization that we fund. So instead of giving your money to the symphony, Symphoria, excuse me, instead of giving your money to Symphoria, you're giving it to me. That creates a little bit of a resentment and a competitive, maybe not as healthy as we'd like it to be relationship. But just as frankly, I will tell you that there are people who understand how different Gifford is, that, that we do, we listen to anybody who wants to, we take a higher degree of risks, we try and take some bigger swings and do things that will move the marker a little bit more. There are people who say, I don't want to just give it to the XYZ organization. I like what you're doing, and I trust that for the last 60 years, what you've done with Rosamund's money is what I want you to do with my money. So we've had some bequests, we've had some gifts, and we had some conversations. We had about, I think there were 10 folks who came together. Um, I, had a, I have a former trustee who, who believes what I just said about the Gifford doing it differently, who um, basically convened 10 acquaintances and they came together and collectively they made a 50,000-ish dollar um, gift to the, community, to, the, to the Gifford Foundation. So we'll, we'll take it, but I don't want to take it in a competitive way and I don't, I don't want to direct my time to raising money. And the trustees have looked with that. And it's not ideal. As I said earlier, we're spending seven, seven and a half percent and we're earning seven, seven and a half percent. The 30 million, $40 million dollars we've given all together, but the $30 million that we gave in those early years, um, I want to, you know, you, you can't keep doing that because $20 million we have to now, now, if I keep giving it away and only keep that $20 million, hoping that the stock market continues to cooperate, that $20 million won't buy the same thing 20 years from now. But our trustees have said right now, this community needs us to be taking some of these risks and doing some of these things. And that's where we are. Yes, sir. It appears that you said that uh, you contribute to 501c3 organizations only. No, I didn't say only. Okay, I know you didn't say <laughs> But my question is, I've heard that, like, I belong to the American Legion, and we're a 501c19, but, the 501, but your organization and other organizations, like Community Foundation, cannot give grants to 501c19. Why is that? Well, that's that's because of the nature of the work that you do. It's not all charitable in some way. There are some right. self, so that's the reason why oh. we can't give to you. Now, if the Legion had a program, I'm gonna make this up, uh, to go into the elementary school and read books to the kids, and you didn't have the books, and so you wanted a grant okay. to buy the books so that your volunteers could go in and read, we might be able to help you find a 501c3 that would be willing to accept the gift from us, shift our burden to some other not-for-profit, to a 501c3, who would then give you the books so that you could go to. So again, because we'll talk to anybody, we want to try and help organizations and individuals who are doing good work. To get through that, I can't give to a C19, but your program is philanthropic. Your, your program is charitable. What you're trying to do is yeah. a good, the, the, the program is good, so let's find another way to get the money to support the program, and we do do that. So we could come to you and ask you to help us find another way to support that program. The program, as long as the program was charitable, and we'd want to charitable. understand why why you were doing what you were doing, but yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the mini grants, those what ifs, the shovels and gloves, we have to find a community center that's a 501c3 that can receive that, or we do community gardens, and so sometimes we might use Onondaga Earth Corps as a 501c3 that does work generally in the, in the, in the neighborhood, no pun intended, of, of, of growing and whatever, the Earth Corps plants trees and so forth. So they might become the fiscal agent, that's what it's called, the fiscal agent for the community garden on the near west side that's just a bunch of neighbors coming together. Thank you. Claire. <clears throat> so what's your favorite project that you've done? Pardon me? What's your favorite project that Rosamund's? <laughs> well, that's, it's difficult because of the breadth of what we do. Um, the capacity building program that we have, which is probably 40% of our grant making dollars, has a huge impact in the community. There's so many ripple effects.
to the grant. It's the consultant that we've trained to help organizations. It's the board members and executive members of the leadership team that now know more about how to run a better organization. It's the, it's the consumers of whatever the agency is. So that's had a lot of impact, and it's 40% of our grant-making dollars. But I love you know, a community garden that brings 25 neighbors together that otherwise are you know, going like this. Together they want to grow collards and, and beets and, and you know, have raised beds, and they come together to do the weeding of the garden. I like programs like that as well. The Southside Food Co-op, $50,000 over two years. When it comes back, it's been closed now for almost two years because they had some false start. Um, I think there's a great potential for that to be How are they doing? Where are they now? I believe that they're very, very close. So that's, that Southside Food Co-op um, got a lot of money from the university. Built a building on the South Side. I don't know if it's on South Ave or South Salina Street. Beautiful building, designed for the purpose. Opened, go. Remember, this is down in the deep south side, very impoverished neighborhood. Didn't take WIC, didn't take food stamps, didn't take the, 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 the method of payment that the people who live there, they hadn't gotten their license or certificate or whatever. And they had some construction overruns or whatever, so it, it didn't make it right away. But the funders, including most of the foundations who, whose names I've rattled off, and the university have said, okay, we're gonna come back together, let's figure out where we can get some money do it right this time. So they engaged the folks who run the Syracuse Food Co-op, Community Food Co-op on Westcott Street to help with the management and oversight. They've gotten the money in place. They've gotten the cert certificates to take WIC and food stamps. So they're very, 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 very close. I think they'll, they'll get there in the next 30, 60, 90 days. I don't know. The newspapers have had a heyday with it. Yeah. They can't find anything else to write about, I think. But. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.